Hista, this is my wonderful housemate and assistant Gavi. Hello. And today we'll be talking and talking about democracy in former Yugoslav countries slash everywhere because why not? We love doing that. <laughs> so to get started, I'm just gonna start making a dough for a wonderful Croatian dish and an only vegan Croatian dish ever, so Stopanik. And while I do that, I'm gonna tell Gabi and you guys a little bit about the history of Yugoslavia, and by a little bit, I mean a little bit. So as mostly everyone knows, do you know what countries made Yugoslavia? Nope. Trivia question. Aha! Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so it was six countries and two autonomous regions. Countries were Slovenia, where Masha is from, mm -hmm. Croatia, Serbia. Hi Masha. Hi Masha. <laughs> <laughs> Montenegro, Bosnia, Herzegovina. Okay. And I'm missing one. Oh, Macedonia, North Macedonia, okay. former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, whatever, yeah. And then you had Vojvodina and Kosovo, which were two regions. And then, after Tito died in, I think, 1980, things started to get a little bit feisty between the countries. And eventually, after the first real elections in 1990, people in their respective countries, but mostly Slovenia and Croatia, said we kind of want to, we want to break free. <laughs> and Fair at that enough. point, <laughs> we, yeah, we encountered some little drama, and there was a, a little bit of a war, which was one of the worst wars since World War II. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit of a war. And after that little episode that lasted Regardless, uh, it depends. And Croatia and Slovenia was ten days. And Croatia was a bit longer. Mm. And Bosnia even longer. So the whole region was kind of shaky. That was in the nineties, you said. That was in the nineties. Mm. And if you ask me, it still is, regardless of what other people say. And then fast forward, you have six democ democratic countries today, allegedly, <laughs> and Kosovo. Allegedly. Allegedly. Because what happened is that after the war and after all the countries became independent, like international community stepped in and they were like, let's help you build capacity, let's help you yeah. create democratic institutions and all of that. And they did. And there's everything that you see everywhere else. Like we mm. have free and fair elections. We have <laughs> multiple yeah. parties everywhere. We have allegedly. allegedly like all the institutions, freedom of speech, media, all of that. But then when you come to the country and you actually look at what's happening, you see that <laughs> the situation is a bit different than what is represented mm -hmm. on paper and what you hear from, well, people, <laughs> international community who help build the countries. So yeah, and that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today is how it's it sucks that people <laughs> were supposed to be like, you know, you have people responsible for one and one thing only, and that's to do their job in the public administration, and that they just don't. Are you talking about international community or are well, you just talking um, about national? Por que no los dos? <laughs> Why not both? <laughs> because then you just, it just, it turns out that everyone does what's easy and what's like politically acceptable. Mm -hmm. But then that's not changing the situation on the ground. It's making it even worse. So, like for example, recently in Serbia, they had elections, and the current former president, so he's still president now, mm -hmm. he won by landslide. It was super, like the competition basically didn't exist. He's super loved. You know, it was. I don't even know how much the percentage was, but it was incredibly high. Mm -hmm. Which is a signal, because he had protests before, after, during the elections. Everyone was saying that uh, this is not what this is supposed to be like. So the people are protesting on the streets of the capital. And then you have people in the EU saying, because the president of Serbia is an EPP member. Mm -hmm. And then you have people from the EPP saying, congrats to our fellow Serbian president Alexander Vucic of another great victory. He only shows that Serbian people love and trust him. <laughs> and then you're just like, <laughs> does it? Does it really show that? Because I don't think so. And it's it's frustrating 
Because, yeah, those are the people who are supposed to be calling this stuff out and be like, hey, <laughs> maybe we should do something about the situation before it gets even worse. Mm. But if you wait long enough, maybe like Orban changes his mind too and you just have freedom of media again in Hungary just because, you know. So, yeah, that's pretty much <laughs> how democracy is happening in the Balkans right now. And I don't know what it's like in Brazil. I mean, I know, I know enough to know that it's not good, mm -hmm. but I don't know, do you also, like the institutions are there, obviously, yeah. but has anything drastically changed in that area since Bolsonaro took power, or? Well, the thing is that, like, in my opinion, at least, democracy is never perfect, like, you can never say, oh, all the institutions work perfectly, there's no corruption, and everybody's going to be just complimenting everything that the country does. I don't think that that's exactly how it works. Like, I understand when you say that they were complimenting this person and you, were, you got mad because, of course, it's not, it's not like, a, as we say in Portuguese, the world is not pink, you know, it's not like that. But at the end, I mean, it's good that you're taking, like, baby steps and you're complimenting the baby steps because if you just wait to compliment when the country is a perfect democracy, then what exactly is a perfect democracy? Is it the U.S. democracy? <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's like... Yeah, I understand when people, because for instance, when I was working in the department, we were dealing with lots of baby steps in democracies in African countries. And of course, if you come with a Western view, you're going to see that, okay, my view, that's not a democracy. But still, like, they are going with baby steps. They are, uh, like, enhancing the human rights scenario in there. Not perfect, but still doing something. So I kind of agree when I see people complimenting these kind of actions, although I see still we have a long path to, to go. And the same in Brazil, like we still have a lot to work on. And what I see people saying a lot, and that actually was one of the big groups that uh, made Bolsonaro be elected, was the fact that people were so, so tired of corruption and they blamed that on democracy. So they were like, Democracy means corruption, and thus we need to have dictatorship again. Like yeah. seriously, during elections, we had people that went to the street protesting for the rights of not protesting anymore because they wanted the, the <laughs> they wanted the military dictatorship to come back again. They were like, bring back the, the military, and etc. And we were like, oh my God, you're protesting for the rights of not protesting. But still, like it's very twisted the way that people see democracy because they imagine it's gonna be perfect, that nothing bad is going to happen, all the institutions are going to work perfectly, and that's not exactly how it goes, but, like, <clears throat> my my teacher of constitutional law back in Brazil, he said something that to me was perfect, it was like, the, the flaws of democracy, we can remedy them with democracy itself. It's not like, oh, we have some flaws here, so the way to to make a solution is just take democracy out and put some detection dictatorship on the place that's not exactly how it works like in theory it's supposed to be really good in practice it's not but you just you can get the remedies from democracy itself like if you say public administration doesn't work it's because you have bad administration you have people doing a poor job then change these people i mean the institution is good the problem is the people that work there you know so yeah, I see this thing in the, I saw this thing in the last election that really bumped me a lot with people actually calling for the dictatorship to come back. And like Bolsonaro, when he was a senator before, he said in lots and lots of statements that he was pro-dictatorship, that he thought that the dictatorship, people think the dictatorship is something so bad. But no, I mean, in Brazil, it was good. His words, okay, not mine, please. <laughs> In Brazil, it was good. You know, the history books, they tell the story totally twisted. I mean, yeah. oh my God, torture? No, of course not. No, he said torture was, not, not torture, but like only bad people, criminals, were in jail during the dictatorship. So it was good. And then it's like, yeah, sure. I mean, if you call anybody that disagrees with your political view criminals, then of course you're going to put tons of people in the prison and it's just going to be fine. So... It's really complicated because people saw in him something different from the big corruption mm -hmm. scandals that we were having. And yeah, so here we are. <laughs> yeah, right. But then so <clears throat> in the EU, when you have Croatia that's in EU and you have like people living in Croatia and seeing how bad the situation is, like how different it is 
in like when you're there compared to what you're reading about and hearing about. Yeah. And then you see like you believe in the EU I and mean, like they're they're here, they're the democratic leaders, values, all of that. They're gonna change something, and then they go and say like, "Good job, President Vucic," yeah. or "Croatia is doing great." How do you think that affects what people like think and feel about the EU? I think it will be the same view that Brazilians have regarding democracy. They're gonna see it as a bad thing, yeah. which is not. It's just it's not working perfectly, and uh, I'm not uh, defending it. No, I really. I think you need to have you know limit at some point of complimenting or just criticizing stuff. But yeah, I think people just think that oh, the EU is not doing a good job, and maybe we should not rely on them anymore. And I see this a lot when it comes to peace building and peace making in countries that were completely destroyed. So you have the UN doing their job of peace building and then peace making, um, sorry, peace making and then peace building, but still, um, it doesn't work perfectly. And then lots of countries criticize saying it's just the, the winner's justice, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I think it's complicated, but at the end, international and European law, if you think that not only law, but like the affairs itself, European affairs, international affairs, it's always a group of people trying to decide what's best for someone that they really don't understand the culture, they really don't understand how things work. So, like, I like to believe that they're trying their best. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes that's not the case. Oh. And it's hard to come up with a decision when you have so many stakeholders trying to make a solution of one thing. Yeah. Because, well, Croatia, I know for sure, since we joined the EU, I don't know the exact number, but it's in hundreds of thousands of young and educated people just said, we can leave now, so that's what we're going to do. Yeah. And when you ask them, it's not, people emigrated before too, because we're in. Sorry, we can leave where? To the EU, anywhere, Germany, okay. Ireland, Belgium. So people are leaving in large numbers, and for the first time, it's not because of war, it's not about the economy. Like the first factor a lot of people mention is, like it's corruption, yeah. it's the lack of any like perspective and future to build your career, build your family, your life, whatever. Yeah. So people are literally leaving because they don't believe the country has any future. And yeah. I read a survey in Serbia where they asked like the youth what they feel about the EU, and they said like we don't care about the EU. But the top reason for joining, I think 70% of them said it's because they want to leave. So we want to join mm. the EU just to leave Serbia. Oh, and I okay. think that says enough about how democracy works in these countries. Like it works for yeah a certain amount of people and then the rest are just, you know, there. Yeah. At the end if you don't have this kind of institutions like the EU, for instance, helping the country itself to get better, to evolve, to develop better economy, sustainable solutions, etc., you're always gonna have people leaving the country. Yeah. And that's it. Like, it also has with colonialism, like, you have countries that exploit it so much out of other countries, and guess what? Now, people from the the former colonies, they want to come to the rich countries, yeah. of course. So it's like, if you just close borders and you just create barriers, that's not going to solve the problem. It's just going to create more and more poor people, refugees, illegal exactly. immigrants. So, yeah, at the end, you should just just <laughs> lots of quote, quotation marks <laughs> but just invest in the country itself and i mean i know that if you think about oh, spain doesn't want to invest in peru why why would they why would they spend their money in peru but it's like if you have <clears throat> let's say a migration crisis then it's better if you do that than just ignore and say you know what all the money we stole back in the past <laughs> it's fine it's, you know what no. happened in the past it just you know move <laughs> regardless <laughs> yeah. move on so yeah at the end, the solutions are never the easiest ones, and that's the problem, because countries, they don't want to, like, take the blame, they don't want to assume that they, not assume, sorry, that's Portuguese, like, they don't want to accept that they yeah. did something wrong in the past, that actually is reflecting on the migration crisis they call nowadays. Yeah. Like, jokes apart, I call migration crisis what happened in the 1500s, I mean, now, yeah. it's fine, <laughs> you know? So, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> But what do you feel? So a lot of times when I criticize Croatia, mm. people tell me, like, who are you to talk who left? Do you think mm. only people who stay can I try to change something <laughs> criticized? Um, I hear that a lot. Yeah. The thing is that, at least for me, like, 
personally, if I could stay in my country and have a good job and quality of life, I would have stayed. Yeah. I mean, I don't live in, in I don't live here like hundreds of thousand kilometers and hours yeah, away from my family. Yeah. <laughs> just because it's fun. You know? It's not how it works. So like I hear a lot because I criticize my, my government also a lot and people are like, you left, you don't have the right to say anything. I'm like, of course I have. I'm still a citizen. I'm exactly. still, I care, you know? So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think like for me in the future when I when I can, when I'm capable of, I would like to invest in Brazil, like to social projects, things yes. like that. So I can try to make a difference a little bit. And I see that this happens a lot with immigrants in general, because if you see the number of remittances that people send to their yeah. own countries, so at the end, okay, they left, but they're still investing, sending money or yeah. helping with something, you know? Exactly. So, and the thing is, yeah. like I said, it's right now it's people who are young and educated are leading in large numbers mm -hmm. so if they don't Ranger, say anything yeah. mm -hmm. I mean who's left is there's not that critical mass in the country yeah <laughs> who can like by themselves make a change and also it's sometimes easier when you're outside to like get other people to actually care about your friend when you're speaking from Croatia about Croatia it gets kind of censored by the time it hits the media or whatever you know mm. I don't know. I feel like here. Sorry, you mean when you are in Croatia? And you are when you're in Croatia, okay. yeah. Here, when like people in the last couple of years, Croatia exploded as a tourist destination, and mm. everyone goes there. Yeah. And then they come back, like when I was living in the U.S., like, why are you here? Why don't you live in Croatia? <laughs> because like that sounds familiar. Because right? <laughs> when you're there, you yeah. see like. Oh, what, what are they complaining about? Everything's uh -huh. pretty. It's cool. Mm -hmm. It's like, look at those beaches, blah, blah, blah. But then when you sit down with people, they're like, you know why? Because, you know, what you're making right now as a college student, your scholarship, my mom makes that in like three months. So, you know, it's yeah. just yeah. yeah. sometimes easier to put things into perspective when you can relate to the people outside of the country. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I get frustrated a lot because I see the potential and there's so... Like, so many educated, smart people mm -hmm. leaving mm -hmm. the country and staying in the country but not being heard or being, like, on purpose marginalized or so many things. And it's so sad because I, yeah. I don't know, I was really hoping that the EU was going to be, like, the magic wand and just, like, comes in and yeah. says, we're going to change things. It takes time. How long is the Croatia in the EU? Not that long. Since 2013? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean but how long is Hungary in the EU? Mm. You know, I feel like it's not even, it's Slovenia joined, not a, like, if you compare Slovenia, well, not now, they're going through a, some, a phase two, yeah. but still, like, if you compare Slovenia with any other Balkan country, it's just not even close to, and I don't know, I don't know what to tell you, but I don't know what the solution is, because mm. going, I can't, if I go back to Croatia, I have nothing to do. Yeah, like I know that I literally am um, starting from scratch. If I want to work in policy, I know I can't because I haven't joined the politi right political party 20 mm -hmm. years ago when I was in diapers. And I haven't donated money for haven't them. donated, yeah. haven't been brainwashed enough or whatnot. <laughs> so I don't know. And I, it's sad because you no, know, you talk about you work in what are like what are the solutions? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> like I think about that actually, but I really don't know how to fix what's going on. Oh, cooking, by the way. <laughs> this is spinach with onion, salt, and what else? Olive oil. Always. Always olive oil on everything. <laughs> and we're going to put it on one piece of dough, and then we're going to put the other on top of it, and we're going to bake it, and then we're going to eat it all at once, because <laughs> why not? That's how we uh, do it. <laughs> that's how we do it. I love this dish because it's so easy to make. I mean, it's also not a traditional recipe. Like, I twisted some things because this is not supposed to be spinach. It's supposed to be like this leafy green that I only can find in Croatia. I never found it anywhere else. Hmm. Also, you're supposed to make this in the outside oven, like the brick one. Oh, okay. Which we don't have here. <laughs> so we never have Yeah, exactly. Like a traditional <laughs> dish, but not really. 
What's the name of the green thing? It's not the light spinach. Uh, I don't even know what the name is. It's it's called blikva in mm -hmm. Croatian. I don't know what the word would be, but I've okay. never seen it at any of the stores. It's also leafy and yeah, a bit sweeter, and I oh. love it. And it's very like in my part of the country, mm -hmm. you eat it a lot. It's yeah. everywhere. And this is like a, I told you, a peasant's dish <laughs> that they used to make, but I love it so much. Uh, now that I've learned how to make it in confinement, <laughs> that's what else am I going to do, right? We only eat peasant dishes, they're the best. We only <laughs> eat peasant <laughs> From all continents, only peasant dishes. Peasants know how to eat. Always. Always. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Back to democracy or back to food? <laughs> I don't know. You choose. Yeah, I choose. Well, I don't even know anymore. Because uh, it's frustrating. When you started like doing your school education, like why did you start to do it? Take the law school and then take another master's and all of that. Like why would you do that? It's so much studying for what? You know, you had a goal, mm. right? Yeah. And most of us, the goal was to go and make policy or to go and change the world and make it a better place, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you stop after getting your degree and spending so much time and energy on it and you're like okay what do I do now yeah, yeah. <laughs> now that I know kind of what's wrong and I know what's supposed to be fixed and blah blah mm. now what like who's gonna listen who's yeah. gonna try to find some solutions yeah, who do you go space. to yeah that's true it's I don't know because even even in the EU and both of us know this it's still a lot of times like talking to a wall like, mm -hmm. this is what's wrong, yes. This is how we're going to fix it, yes. Then why is it not getting fixed? You know, politics. <laughs> and it's frustrating, but, yeah. But, but I'm happy that the generations are changing, you know, and yeah. the mindset is changing, because I see that these kind of things which was mentioned, they happen because you have so many people with old mindsets still working in those institutions that, and they really, really think they're still in the 90s or something, or the 80s, or even like Cold War and this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, you know, when you go like, like in Brazil, you see people talking about, you know, communism and like if it was the, the worst thing in the world, blah, blah, blah. and it was like, we were not even that affected by communism in Brazil. I mean, it's crazy the way people talk. It's really like Cold War mindset, yep. something that we didn't even have. Yep. So... I'm so glad you mentioned yeah. that because that, like, I was born in 95. The war in Croatia ended, technically 95. Okay. And I see people, my generation and younger, like, saying, I'm going to vote for this party because that other, like, they collaborated with Serbs. <laughs> like, you, what do you know about war? Like, most of them don't even know history of it. Mm. Most of them just, like, are brainwashed by nationalist parties, blah, blah, blah. But you still, yeah. people used war from 25 years ago mm. to just like replace any real policies or any real effort to make a change like yeah like we don't know what we're doing we don't have no program but go croatia here's a flag yeah play the anthem and no, that's but, it i mean come on of course it's important to have a project when you are in a pie of course yeah but like if you think the other way around like if you have a party that beautiful projects they have but they're called neo-nazi vote for them. I mean, absolutely so not. Like, yeah, so I think it kind of makes also a different, like, we have parties like Bolsonaro, for instance, that they were pro-detectorship. So to me, only because they were pro-detectorship, I don't vote on them. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't generalize, not the whole party, of course, but still, yeah. if I see someone making this kind of statement, although the person might have a few good projects, to me, this kind of statement, they matter so much yeah. that I would Obviously, just... Yeah. Yeah, you know, I would just not vote for them. So I kind of understand, but of course you need to have some some background, have, some study, uh, and some exactly. Yeah, that too. Okay, do you think that politicians should have a degree or experience? Because I was talking to our Ilaria, our other housemate, mm -hmm. about this, and yeah, you need to have qualifications to enter any job. Mm -hmm. But politicians, like people who are <laughs> pretty much deciding the future and the path of your country, they can be anyone. Yeah. So, like, maybe not degree, but some experience, or, like, just to show, like, why you're qualified to leave the country and make decisions. Mm. Do you think that should be a thing? I think, 
As a good lawyer, I'm gonna say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, uh, uh, like the point of view from a developed country is sort of different from an underdeveloped country because when it comes to education, being educated in an underdeveloped country means a privilege. So okay, but experience. That's yes, so yeah. and that's uh, I was just about to say that to me it's not because in Brazil people are discussing like oh you need to have a university degree and I I totally disagree with that because not everyone can yeah. afford or can yeah. have the opportunity to study in university but like sometimes you don't have a university degree but you've been working I don't know in a company in a public institution for so many years like we see we see job openings say we would like someone with university level but if you have like, 10 years of experience in a good place why not yeah you know? exactly it's easy, easy but still like you can have this kind of things because i just think that being famous you know like a populist person and that's it no experience whatsoever i i think you should not be a politician i mean you. first you learn how to do stuff and then you're gonna go to public administration. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but like yeah. that just disappeared in the recent years. Like, oh, I get people mm. behind me. I have enough friends, yeah. and they're gonna vote for me. That's I have it. good ideas. Ooh. And like, I understand. Like, good idea is okay, but there's people, <laughs> even without those. And I'm talking about Croatia specifically now. Who, literally, like I told you, I was in a war, or I don't know. I'm gonna bring back whatever some conservative ideas. I have no other program, I have no other qualifications, but you know, people like me. Yeah. Because I was a like, yeah. folk singer or something, and I'm not even overreacting. I and then, yeah. At the, the end, second most powerful party in Croatia right now. Most people don't think that if you vote for these people that have no qualification in the sense that they don't have work experience or at least knowledge in the field, you are going, you're going to elect this person to have a huge salary and have a huge power, but at the end, who is going to do the job is the assistant. Yeah. Because this person doesn't know how to put things in practice. And that's what we see a lot. Like the public machine in Brazil, it's madness. Because you have one Congress uh, person from the lower house, let's say so, that knows nothing about public administration, how to put things in practice, how to take a good idea sometimes, to, to do something nice, to put into a public policy or something. And then at the end, who does the work? the assistants, all the trainees, or the yeah. interns, <laughs> and then it's like, why are you paying so many people, because you elected one, and at the end, the public money goes to like, 10 people in the cabinet, exactly. or 15, you know, so to me, that bothers me a lot, because people don't think about that, they go like, oh, no, but this person has nice ideas, but do you think he's going to work along, like, for real, no, and most of the time, they're just the face, yeah, like you said, and what happens, <laughs> if they do anything, because that's another thing, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I am so frustrated with the amount of days off and like <laughs> excuses people yeah. can use for not showing up for their work if they work in public administration, especially yeah. in government. It's like that's your job. You have to be there. They don't show up for votes. They don't show up for discussions. Yeah. What? I, it's I, it's mind blowing. Like it's your job, sir. Show to up. To me. Two public policies that I think should be applied to politicians. We actually had those projects in Brazil, but of course they didn't go for it. First, <laughs> to have like a, the digital thing when you go to work, so you can see when you go in and when you go out, when you stop for lunch. So you can yeah. kind of control these you people, as you would do with your employers in a normal company. Right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, they are working with public money. Why shouldn't be the control too? Exactly. The second thing, this one was one of my favorite public policies. It's a shame it didn't go for it, was that if you are a politician, you're obliged to put your kids in public school so it's like at the end public school at least in my country they suck usually yeah. and uh, then if you are obliged to do that probably magically some public money are gonna go to public school yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so Persian, me, though, public we... schools are still good but again there's of course neighborhoods that have more money than others there's yeah. like in Croatia church gets a lot of money what you have like there it's church Education, culture, mm. it's all in one sector. And just recently, like two weeks ago, there was like 60 million, um, I don't remember the number, like mm. Croatian currency going to some projects and like 55 of it went to the church. Oh. <laughs> and the rest like kindergartens and schools and hospitals. Like, I, what? <laughs> what is going on? Mm. And that's just like one of my favorite. I think Germany does that. You have to register... Like, if you're a registered Catholic, you okay. have to pay taxes 
like that go to the church, and if not, you don't have to pay for them. Oh. So mm-hmm. Croatians are traditionally very like there's a large number of Catholics in Croatia, and there's a large diaspora in Germany. Mm. And since that law passed, the number of Catholics in Germany, Croatians, dropped significantly. Like, <laughs> no one's a Catholic anymore. <laughs> like, since I don't have to pay, I don't like... It's just so much hypocrisy. But in Croatia, it's fine if all this public money goes to that because... I don't know. Just because. <laughs> Cooking break again. So our dish is in the oven. <laughs> 200 Celsius degrees for 20-ish minutes. And like real Croatians, we're making coffee while we wait, because, <laughs> you know, why not? Then I'm going to make the garlic thingy that goes over. You put a garlic thing over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you take it out of the oven, you mix garlic and olive oil again, and then you just, like, put it over the... Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. And I love garlic, as you know. Garlic, onions, and olive oil are the best things in the world. So, back home, it's garlic... Um, what do you call it? Parsley mm-hmm. and olive oil is the holy trinity. Yeah, it goes in everything. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. My mom doesn't start any dish without those three things and also onions to begin. Like, I don't have onions, I can't cook. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, the good things. That's the one good thing about this confinement and not doing anything for six months is that I just started cooking because. What else are we going to do? <laughs> yep. And you discover a lot. And then, like, I used to never read the whole recipe because I don't follow recipes. <laughs> As you see, like, 400 grams, sure, whatever. <laughs> but I would read about the dishes because I was interested. And then you learn a lot, like, how old ladies used to make something because they yeah. only had this and that and blah, blah, blah. And now it's, like, a specialty in restaurants. <laughs> so, Yeah. My Hello. grandma does a, a bread in Easter that she says you need to pray over the bread though, otherwise it doesn't go right. It's just so bad. <laughs> pray and pray. I'm like, okay. That's the sweet bread, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's the one that has the, the eggs, well, eggs on top. I think I showed you. Yeah, that. I did. I can't wait for Christmas. I like all Easter. <laughs> oh, and Easter. I don't know how to do that, by the Aww. way. We need to learn. <laughs> well, we have time. That's one. And two, can we do it for Christmas too? Because sure. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I think we cook too much in this house, but I'm okay with that. That's good. Yeah, it's always good. I uh, what's the dish that reminds you of home the most? Parofa. Parofa. Yeah, it's feijoada, but I don't make feijoada. So, you yeah. still need to make the <laughs> the veggie version. Yeah, I mean, I tried some vegetarian feijoadas and they were good, but to me, like, I like beans anyway. So I don't need to put like fake meat. Yeah, you know? I just yeah, eat the you're right. That's it. That yeah. is the best part, if you ask me. Yep. Let me get the cups. I. What else? What haven't I talked to you about <laughs> regarding Croatia? What else do I hate? This video is gonna be huge. <laughs> no, it's like 30, 40 minutes. Yeah, it's fine. People get to look at our wonderful kitchen. I think we need to start a cooking show. I'm like, I think so. It looks nice in the video. The kitchen looks really good. Right? Yes. <laughs> Welcome. This is Jamie Oliver, if you're watching, please reach out. Uh, we are ready for collaboration. Yeah, but I think the foods that are most famous are feijoada, always farofa. Not everybody likes farofa because it looks like sand, as I said. But it's good that we have more for us. So. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, the sweets. Brigade uh, and Beijing. Famous. Which are the best things in the world. <laughs> I don't know. I think yeah. food. So that's another thing I noticed back home with Croatians. I'm very like, I have my friends, and then you judge the other people all the time. Like, oh, look at that person. They're from the north. They don't know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But then, like, when I was in the US and here in Belgium, like, you're from the Balkans. Come here, brother. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> the Balkans. No, they literally. don't even know the country. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Masha and I were like, yeah. I can speak seven sentences with someone, that's enough. Like oh my, my Slovenian sister, welcome home. Do you have the same thing? Like, do you feel closer to Brazilians when you see them here? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Especially because usually Brazilians that go out of Brazil, they don't like Bolsonaro, so it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, but funny part is that we have tons of Brazilians going to Portugal since, I would say, the last three years. And uh, they are pro-Bolsonaro and they went to a country that is kind of socialist. 
So it's like, okay. You like the the policies in Portugal, but you defend something that's totally right. against it. in oh, your yeah. own country, so we don't really understand. But usually people that are like, uh, I was living in the Netherlands before, I only met amazing Brazilians, and here I didn't meet anyone. So, um, but yeah, usually they are open-minded, good, good people. Good people. I know two Brazilians and I love both of them, so. <laughs> 100% success rate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what else can I talk about? A fun fact, <laughs> though, we don't, see, we don't speak Spanish in Brazil. Just so that's people know. <laughs> yeah. That's not a fun fact. That's like the most basic <laughs> education. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, the Rio is not the capital, which Rio apparently is not confusing capital. for some people. No, no, no. It was, but it's not anymore. So. What other fun facts? Uh, Croatia was never in Russia. That's not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. People thought, that, oh my god. Oh, yeah, okay. I would say I'm from Croatia. Russia? Like, Croatia. Oh, yeah, oh, Russia. <laughs> like, no. That's the same thing. Also, people think we were a part of the USSR. Also, never happened. Oh. Actually, Tito. That one I didn't know. He had a beef with, St with Stalin. Yeah, they were like trying to kill each other all the time. And there's a legend <laughs> that Stalin kept sending. <laughs> Uh, like hitman to kill Tito, and one time he caught one of them mm. and sent him back with a letter saying like, "Nice try. If I catch one of them, like, you will be dead." Or so, I don't remember the exact letter, but he was like, "What are you doing? Try again, and this is the end of you." Oh god! And it's like a <laughs> urban legend. Like, our dictator was cooler than yours. <laughs> Passive aggressive person. No, yeah. Also, another fun fact. <laughs> Eurovision. So you had like the Western countries were yeah. the first ones, and then out of the Eastern ones, Yugoslavia was the one to join first because they wanted to like it was a soft power thing. They wanted to counter USSR. Like okay. Yugoslavia is with us, not with oh. you. <laughs> so we joined the Eurovision pretty quickly. <laughs> it was great. It's talk about democracy. That's the yeah. thing that really connects <laughs> the whole Europe. I That's don't know. True. Like, it's the best thing. I need people to study how that works, to implement it in local governments. I don't know, because I'm sorry, it's wonderful. Do you have any countries, like, close to Croatia that people don't like, like Brazil and Argentina, for instance? Or do you have anything like that that people go like, ah, oh, this person is from blah, blah, blah? We have a stereotype, a negative one, for literally each of our neighbors. Okay. Like, all of them. With Serbia, it's like, oh, war, blah, blah, blah. Then you have... Slovenians, we say, like, oh, they're arrogant, they think they're better than us. Mm. Then you have Montenegrins, that everyone just say they're lazy. You don't know why, okay. but, you know, they're lazy. <laughs> uh, with Bosnia Herzegovina, like the Herzegovina part, the mm. Serbo, not the Croatian Bosnian part of the Federation. So we have a lot of leftist Croatians don't like that they can also vote and, like, influence the Croatian vote in the, the, in the elections. Mm. So that's a whole nother, like, why are they voting, blah, 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 <laughs> take their citizenship away. It's literally with everyone. <clears throat> we Yeah, but then I'm telling you, if I go home and I see someone, okay, maybe not me because I'm so lovely, but other people would say <laughs> <laughs> those things, but then you leave Croatia or the Balkans, and then in Germany there's a large community, and everyone's like, this is brother, like, where are you, brother? What's up? Come here, like, we are all brothers and sisters. <laughs> Go Yugoslavia and whatnot. And then you come home and they're no. <laughs> super nationalist, like boo, oh, only God. flags and anthems everywhere. And I'm yeah. beating up people when they show up. I think last year or two years ago, there was a team from Serbia. Yeah. Just walking. Walking in my hometown. Yeah. And they and they had like a little flag or something on their jerseys, because they're a team, like a sports team. Mm. Got beat up <laughs> because they had a Serbian flag on their shirt. Okay. And you're like, it's literally been so much time, and you don't have, you don't want like teams playing it's against so each weird. other because of a war 25 years ago. And again, it's the young people, which kills me from the inside because why? <laughs> you, you you, I don't know. That is one thing that we don't see a lot. I won't say you don't see in, in Brazil, because like usually when you have this kind of stupid things happening, 
For instance, if you go to a protest and you're wearing red, we're going to assume you're a communist. And then we're going to beat you up. But usually the people that beat people up are like old, you know, close-minded. You don't see much, again, not that you don't see, but you don't see much of young people doing this kind of things, you know, because it's just, yeah. No, it's sad. And then it explains why democracy is not improving much, because if you have people like that who are mm -hmm. easily influenced, who are just guided by hate, yeah. against everything, mm -hmm. like, yeah, they're going to vote for whoever they, so, I don't know. Yeah. It's not the program they're interested in, it's literally just... But do you think that know. this is because people are intolerant, or just, they like to discriminate, or I don't know the word for that, but I'm asking because in my country I see that most, mostly it's because people are not educated, they don't know actually what democracy is, and as I mentioned before, as they never study, they never know exactly what it is, when they see in their lives so much corruption going on, they assume democracy means corruption. And so they say democracy is bad. Like, I don't know how it goes in your country. Do you think that when people vote for things like that, or when they are intolerant, or when they say, oh no, we need to come back with a dictatorship whatsoever, it's because they don't know what it means, or it's just because... I, <laughs> I, don't, I highly doubt it, because I know people close to me who have their degrees, who like, mm. are bright, smart people, and then they catch on like some little sentence that someone said, and like, oh, that person is against freedom of religion. I'm not oh, going to okay. vote for them. I'm going to vote for the the nationalist one. Or mm. it's just like they get super focused, and that's like that's that's politics because they frame yeah. one issue and make it like the central part of everything that in the end is irrelevant for your lives. Like, I don't know, if gay people can adopt children, and that was a discussion topic for a year. At the end of the day, if you are a, like a straight couple living in whoever knows where, yeah. how are you affected by that? Like, you you would be affected by policies like for your children, like education, mm -hmm. healthcare, all of that. But you are not thinking about that. You're thinking about what someone else is doing with children that you don't want to adopt. Yeah. It's yeah. just, I don't know. It's That's why I get frustrated that and many other things, but it's, I, I don't see the purpose of mm -hmm. engaging in topics that in the end are not going to affect your life in any, don't any way. You at all. Exactly. Yeah. It's just what people want to impose to others and that's it. Yep, and that's what guides your decisions at the end. <laughs> like, that's why we are miserable. Okay, that's a bit dark. I love my country, <laughs> I really do. I just, because I love it, I want to see it better. Yeah. And that is why I'm angry most of the time. And I don't read Croatian news anymore because I would just... Mm -hmm. It was the... In the U.S., I would... Before bed, it's like around midnight because it's seven hour difference. I would just like go on Twitter and start scrolling, you know, like just before bed. And then all the Croatian news at 7 a.m. in Croatia would start publishing articles. And like, this politician said that. Government decided to do this, blah, blah. And I could not go to sleep for another two hours because I would just be so upset with whatever I read. So I had to stop doing that. It was literally hurting me. Yeah, yeah same. I mean, during the pandemic, I decided to stop reading so many news about my country because I was getting so depressed and, and angry all the time and discussing with my family all the time. And it, yeah, I mean, there's literally nothing you can do from here when it comes to this kind of politics. Yeah. Because, yeah. Well. Such is life. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't even know. I just hope things change eventually. I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know what we can do about it. But okay, I'm gonna yeah. take this thing out. Already? Yeah, it's been 20 minutes, right? But it's kind of it's white, you know? white -ish. Yeah, it's gonna stay whiteish. Okay. Well, maybe like two more minutes. Sure. And then we're gonna put the garlic oil thing over it, and then we're gonna wait for it to cool down. And then we're going to eat it, <laughs> which is the best part. Uh, and that's about it. Any closing words for our lovely audience of, I don't even know who's watching. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> uh, I have hopes that new generations, like starting from ours and younger people, they are going to make some change because, first of all, we have so much information nowadays and people actually know what things are about. They're not going to say, oh, there was no corruption during the dictatorship because no no one knew what was going on. Yeah. So it was the lack of information that actually people thought something was good. 
I'm just giving an example, but this you can apply to any situation whatsoever. So I think that people first have more information nowadays and young people, again, they know how to deal with fake news. They know. I mean, they know better than yeah. our parents, yeah. for instance, you know. And so, yeah, I think maybe in a couple of years from now, we're going to have a renew of the politicians around and uh, maybe the administration also. Hopefully, yeah, something will change because <laughs> I see people so much more like caring more about, you know, production chain and where did this thing come from? Like, is this one year? Okay, but do, do you have modern slavery involved on it? Yeah. You know, usually our parents, they will not even think about because they didn't know. Yeah. So it's nice that people are more informed and they, they can differentiate what is true, what is not. So that's yeah, that's a good thing. And Hopefully. that's <laughs> why I like globalization because yeah, you can connect with people everywhere. Like you and I, Croatia and Brazil are discussing a topic that's common to us, but like our parents would probably not be able to because yeah. you don't know about it, you can't get in touch with it's just like we're getting so smaller, the whole world and mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing yeah because you see things elsewhere yeah and you see that what's happening in your country is probably not as normal as you are led to believe so yeah mm -hmm. and young people it's all on you <laughs> I say that as an old lady <laughs> okay yeah this is good yeah yeah uh -huh. it's kind of brownish yeah yeah and then once you put this on it yeah. it's gonna be all goldenish, and that's it. Yes. So I'm gonna put this over. Thank you all again <laughs> for watching. If there's anyone there, and keep watching other things that are gonna be more inspiring than my little little pie. Ah, come on, you have fun. But and I was not an assistant. I'm just here to chat and eat. So. You are a lovely assistant. Everyone needs like a you know a magician and a lovely assistant. Yeah. So thank you all. Bye bye. And now we go eat. Yay! Yes, <laughs> it was fun. Perfect. I don't remember uh, you putting garlic. Yeah, every time. Oh. Ah. It's... Mm -hmm. But it like... Because this deflates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the garlic just like kind of melts and sticks to the crust. Uh, so you taste it, right. but you don't see it. Because mm -hmm. it's magic. <laughs> You're going to put it back in the oven or just stay like that? It's it needs to calm down. It'll calm down. Cool down. It needs to come you down. You need to calm bit. down. <laughs> okay, now get ready. That was good. That's and fun. I learned. You learned. Oh, yeah. I learned too. Six countries in the. Uh huh. In the, before we ever saw it. Okay. See? Hmm. You know, I need to read more about the Balkans because I had, like, so I, want, I, I don't want to say anything super good. Balkans and former Yugoslavia is the same, like, if it's yeah. in general. So, right now, people don't call it former Yugoslavia, you just call it the Balkans. Like, okay. Or Western Balkans, mostly. But it's the same country. Okay. Yeah, same countries. Some people include Bulgaria into the Balkans, mm -hmm. but Western Balkans is the former Yugoslavia. The yeah, same. I mean, is there anything in common for them to become a group? Like, because you guys speak different languages, right? So... Technically, but it's like, you see, Masha and I understand each other. Yeah. So yeah. it's like that. And we were all the same country. Like, they all knew how to speak each other's languages. Mm -hmm. So they were all under the same administration, so it makes sense that it's still the same group. Yeah. You know. And when the Yugoslavia was formed, mm -hmm. was it probably a prob stupid question, but still, like, was it something like the Soviet Union, in the sense that they forced and there was war and like, nope. uh, no, no, this just was people very just... voluntary. People were like, it was after that. This was the second Yugoslavia, so mm. they tried once before. Okay. And after World War Two, like the whole Europe was a mess, and they were like, yeah. we are probably better off together mm -hmm. than as small little countries. Who knows what shit's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. So, yeah. But it was not like EU, it was not like a block. It was a country. Like, it was yeah, all together. Okay. Yeah. Like, federation. Right? Yeah. Okay, nice. That's pretty cool. Okay, stop this. <laughs>